All right. Three, two, one. Welcome to Double Fries No Slaw. I am Richie Barnes, and I'm not here with my normal co-host, TJ. We gave him the night off because I wanted to bring in some guests who actually know the subject matter of what we're talking about today. So I brought in two of the who I think are the best people covering Florida State basketball right now. Um, this will be a Florida State basketball season preview, and I'm joined on the bottom there by Chris Nee of Knowles247.com and the On the Bench podcast. In the top left, you'll see Austin Beasy of NoelGameDay.com, a Sports Illustrated affiliate, and from the Hear the Spear podcast. How are we doing tonight, fellas? Good, man. How about you? I cannot complain. We are here to talk basketball, which I, I know we all have our own podcast. And, and, you know, Austin and Chris, you do a lot of writing and covering the team. And it's hard when we're setting these outlines. How much time can we give to basketball? Because we know everyone wants to hear about football. So it's exciting to be able to do a podcast just to talk about basketball. Um, Austin, a, a former team manager, how, how are you doing today? Uh, you getting re- excited for the season? Doing great. We're two weeks from the season. Got an exhibition game Thursday. I'm ready to get the season rolling. It should be a really fun one. After last season was weird, you know, it's the yeah. best way to describe it. Like the team had so much talent. It was just it was a weird season all year. So a lot of talent. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and anyone who's watched any NBA games recently, it's hard to find one without some nulls, and uh, obviously Florida State replacing a lot. Uh, But before we get into it, uh, Florida State number 20 in the preseason, uh, top 25 in the AP poll, Uh, Duke 9, North Carolina 19, Virginia 25th round out the ACC, and Florida State is actually picked second in the league in the preseason by the ACC media, which I believe you both voted on. Do either of those numbers surprise you, or do they sound about right? I think they're fair. Go ahead, Austin. Yeah, yeah the, the ACC poll was absolutely fair. I, I voted Florida State second, voted Duke first. Um, I was surprised by that. I was a little surprised by the AP poll. Um, I figured Florida State would be in that 16, 17 range. Um, but but ACC media poll is exactly what I expected on that end. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I, I wasn't surprised by how it played out. I, uh, I'm sure we'll dip into it. I don't love Virginia. I think they're probably the most overrated team in the league, but they get kind of their due because what they've done in recent years. But, yeah, where FSU settled in, I, I agree with it. UNC being ahead of them in the AP is UNC with the quality of the name on the jersey. Yeah, I, I completely agree on Virginia. I think I finished them to, picked them to finish fifth, and even that I was like, is that, is that a little too high? Because um, yeah. outside of Jay Gardner, I just I don't like anyone on, on that team. Um, yeah, I like Vitek Tech a lot. I think they're the team that probably deserved the credit that Virginia got. And computers seem to like Notre Dame. I'm not on board with that quite yet, but I think Notre Dame's better than where they're being picked by most non-computer type items. I agree. Paul Atkinson is a real kid from Yale. I mean, that dude's got special footwork in the post. You, you see him do stuff that you do not see anymore from Biggs these days. Notre Dame's, I think they'll be solid. I, I agree. Ken Palm has them like 27th, which is way too high. Um I'm not as high on Virginia Tech. I thought they were a little bit of fool's gold last year. Um, a lot of the, t- a lot of the teams they canceled games with with COVID were, you know, Florida State, North Carolina, Virginia. A lot of these games got canceled. Um, so they already beat up, beat up on lesser opponents. We'll see. I really like Louisville. Um, I think they have a lot of guard talent, a lot of scores. I don't know how they're going to be ball handling wise losing Carly Jones. They just have five or six guys that can fill up the bucket any given night. Yeah, weird thing with Louisville last year is probably of all the ACC teams, they were probably the most impacted by COVID. Yeah, and, and you both kind of touched on it right there, but uh, just expand a little bit more for, you know, your casual basketball fan, someone like myself who, you know, I, I pride myself in knowing Florida State pretty well, but don't really pay attention to the rest of the league until the season gets going. Uh, just teams to really look out for that that could be, a, you know, give Florida State problems and just a couple names to know around the league. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I mean, it starts with Duke and Bonchero, the freshman, the Italian big man, number one player in the country by some rankings. I think ESPN had him one. He's preseason ACC player of the year, rookie of the year pick by the media. He's good. He's legitimately good, and he should make Duke very, very good in Coach K's last year. UNC is going to be interesting with Hubie Davis's first year post Roy Williams. It will be interesting. Uh, Baycott's a big man that's back for them. A lot of people expect him to – expand his game and improve FSU's right there in that discussion. As I mentioned earlier, I like VTech. Uh, big man Aluma with them is a kid that I just think is a heck of a good player. I think he averaged around 15 last year. But after that, I think after the top four or five of the league, if you want to throw Virginia in that group, 
And I guess you can throw Louisville in there. So that's six. I, I think it's a pretty interesting race on the back end of a lot of teams that I don't really know a whole lot about. There's been a heck of a lot of change over, and that's true in the whole college basketball landscape. But like Georgia Tech, I'm very interested in what they're going to be this year with so many of those crucial pieces that were the guys they leaned on so heavily departed from last year's team. Miami's roster is very, very different, but they got Wong who can fill it up, can be kind of that catalyst for them to have some success. They've also dealt with a boatload of injuries the last couple of years that have kind of stymied any progress for them. Uh, Louisville, as we referenced earlier, that was a COVID-heavy team last year. I think they had two breaks of like two and a half weeks each. Uh, kind of just you don't you don't create any consistency and rhythm when you have those kind of issues. We know Chris Mack can recruit. I think they had the third best class in the league last year, if I remember correctly. So they brought in a lot of talent. Bayheim and Syracuse is always kind of an interesting thing to watch. Obviously, with Buddy being there, they're still going to be able to do some things with him filling it up from the perimeter. But yeah, the back half of the league, those bottom six or so teams. I'm really interested to watch the early season games just to see what the heck they are because there's not a ton returning on some of those squads. Yeah, pretty much to what Chris alluded to, you have that top six to seven of to me to me it's the top two of Duke, Florida State, and then you have another class of North Carolina, Virginia, Virginia Tech, Louisville. Um then after that, like you said, it's not that great. Um I think Syracuse is interesting at the very least. You, you know, you have you now have two Bayheims with with Jimmy coming over from Cornell. Um, you still have Gerardo at point, but they're not your usual two three team that likes to fill it up with athleticism. It's three scores, and then they got they got that true freshman. I forget his name off the top of my head. Um, that that can play the four, good good defender. But it's a weird team. But for some reason, I kind of like it. Um, the two three able to hide some of their defensive inefficiencies with the two Bayheims on the wing. For some reason, I like them. Then, yeah, we, we talked about Notre Dame earlier. I think they'll be interesting. I think they're going to win a couple games here and there that they probably shouldn't. I'm really interested to see what Clemson is this year after losing Amir Sims. Um, and it's the, the bottom four to five teams are just – they're so bad. Um, Wake, Wake Forest will be good in a couple of seasons. Steve Forbes is just that good of a coach. But this year is not that year. Miami's front court is probably the worst in the league. I just don't, I just don't like their front court at all. But it, like Chris said, they got Isaiah Wan, who's as good as any player in the conference. And Pittsburgh and Boston College, I just I don't expect anything from them this year. Yeah, Miami goes as Wong and McGusty takes them. If yeah. those guys can score a bunch in a night, they'll have a chance to win. If one of those guys is off, they probably don't win because they probably can't score enough. It's, it's going to be very little defense down there in South Beach. I mean, very, <laughs> very little. Yeah, and you talked about a couple of newcomers. Florida State, you know, they're replacing a lot. That uh, Just going back to – you know, MJ Walker, Scotty Barnes, Raekwon Gray, they averaged 34.4 points of a game between the three of them last year. Um, a lot of newcomers on this team, uh, you know, have a lot of potential. You know, Matthew Cleveland, Cameron Fletcher, Caleb Mills, Jalen Morley, John Butler, uh, just naming a few. It just where's Florida State going to replace those 34 points? Um, obviously, you know, Leonard Hampson does a great job of not relying on one player. I don't think we've had a, a you know, a one man offense since the Tony Douglas days. But what are your thoughts on the newcomers? Obviously, Caleb Mills is the one that, you know, a lot of fans are really excited about. Uh, Austin, I see you shaking your head. I'll, I'll go to you first here. Yeah, I, I was telling the story to someone yesterday. Um, I, I was just hitting up my usual people about recruiting. And they go, off topic, Caleb Mills is that guy. And th that's just what you hear to anyone you talk to around the program. Current players, former players, like Caleb Mills is that guy. Um, if there ever was going to be a one-man offense these days, it's going to start with him because he's apparently he's just lighting up practices. Um, you could tell he's already earned the trust because he, he's been sitting out scrimmages when healthy. Staff absolutely loves him, and, and I would not be surprised to see him put up 14, 15 points, even though that's not what we expect from a Leonard Hamilton team these days. But Caleb Mills is absolutely the guy that's – people are going to look back at the end of the season and go, whoa, this guy's good. Yeah, to add to that, uh, Chuck Walsh, Sports Information Director for Hoops, told me the other day Mills is available to talk finally. So I hopped on that immediately and actually spoke to him earlier today. I think people should be really excited about him. I feel like in some ways, because he was a January transfer and he was only on that market for like six days or so, and it was pretty clear he was going to FSU a few days before he even made it official, that he's almost forgotten as being one of the best transfers in the country. He's a 6'5", long guard, can do a bunch of stuff, score from different levels, and he loves playing defense. And he comes from a program that was damn good at playing some defense at Houston, and he likes it. He's competitive. 
I mean, I kind of enjoy if you watch ACC Twitter off, uh, they asked by the podium, they were asked a question, Anthony Flight and Malik Osborne about Mills saying he's going to be the best defender. And I asked Mills about that today. He's like, oh, I just like trash talking my guys because I'm competitive. He is constantly that way. The other thing about Mills is he's already a guy that when they're trying to bring Worley and Cleveland and some of these other young pups along, they lean on him. You know, you're talking about a guy who's been here for almost 11 months now, but he's already sort of that crucial piece where along with the Anthony Polites and Malik Osborne's and the White Wilkes and Lindner and Pre- uh, Harry, they're leaning on those guys. And uh, I think Caleb's going to be special. I think Caleb's a guy that people are going to look back come February and be like, why was he not on an all ACC first or second team preseason? Why was he not in this discussion for these different things from being the best transfer maybe in the country or one of the best transfers? Really, really good guy. I think the other guy that's going to help him is Anthony Polite. I think the averages will go up with him. I think also he's just a heck of a good leader. He's developed into that role. He's very comfortable with that role. And I think having a couple other guards to take some of the weight off of him in the sense of maybe handling it some, maybe having to work around, he's going to be a spot-up shooter that when you rotate, get him the ball, get him a good look, he's going to knock it down at a 45 50% rate. So I, I feel good about the team's capability of replacing. I think it's 69.9% of points per game production from an average standpoint departed. Um and as you mentioned, Richie, those three were a huge piece of that puzzle. I feel like this group with Mills, with Polite stepping up, and then we'll talk about the young guys, but you know, I think Worley and Cleveland are two that are going to be pretty crucial pieces this go-round right now. Yeah, going back to your point about Mills, if you go back and watch his freshman season at Houston, there, there's so many tapes of him running back in transition and blocking shots on defense, which that's what we see out of Florida State all the time. It's what you expect from Leonard Hamilton defense is rushing back, blocking those shots in transition. He's super competitive, wants to win, and wants the ball in his hands when it matters most. And Florida State wants that. They, they, they haven't had that since Dwayne Bacon. And I, I think that's huge to have a guy that you can go to. And, and to your point about not being on an all-ACC team, he wasn't even on the ballot. You, you couldn't even vote for him. The only two yeah, Florida State guys you could right. vote for were Anthony Polite and Malik Osborne. I was going to vote for him because I just I have that kind of expectation for him, but wasn't on the ballot. And I was, I was very surprised by that. Um, to your point about Anthony, Anthony Polite, I really think he's in line for the next step scoring wise. We saw him double his scoring last year from just over five points to just over 10 points. I, I, th- I really think he's in line for a big season. He, when I talked to him at ACC media day, he, he really wants to improve his defense, which of all things, that's not, that's not what I expected him to say. I wouldn't be surprised if he comes out all ACC first team defense, just how competitive he is. And to your point, he can knock down that corner three when it's needed most. And, We'll talk about Matthew Cleveland here in a second, but he's absolutely got the potential to to fill that third scoring role. You know, Florida State doesn't want to rely too heavily on one or two guys, but he's got that potential to come in and average double digit points right away. I, I have no hesitation about that. Just to add on, polite, he's had a little bit of a knee issue here in the preseason at times. He banged it up and then he got back to action and actually banged it up in the first practice back. I don't think it will be something that lasts or causes major issues, but. It would not shock me if on Thursday evening we don't see him go just to, you know, Leonard likes keeping his guys in bubble wrap if he doesn't have to roll them out there if it's not a necessity. Yeah. So, so in regards to polite, you know, he's one of those like classic Leonard Hamilton stories, right? Not not highly regarded out of, out of high school, but comes in, you look at him as a freshman, you're like, eh, okay, I'm not sure. And now he could be, you know, defensive player of the year in the conference potentially. Uh, he's just that good. Is he ready to be the – that leader in the locker room or, or is it Malik or is it a combination of the two? Or what are we looking at this season from that dynamic? I think Anthony wholeheartedly is. I think late last year we saw that come out of him, especially in tournament time. I think Malik's another guy you can rely on. When Malik talks, he literally sounds like an echo chamber of the coaching staff, especially coach Hamilton, with just the way he speaks about the team dynamic, the brotherhood effort, the things we do. It doesn't matter who scores. It matters that we get wins, all that stuff. It's just so consistent with him. It's kind of crazy. Uh, ACC tip-off, for example, listening to him speak, how much of it just sounds like regurgitation of the staff. But it's not like he's forcing it. It's just how he thinks, how he operates. And he's been pretty consistent at being that guy since he got here. You know, he's, I remember after UF game last year, him having a moment where it entirely reminded me of it as though I was speaking to Leonard Hamilton about it. But I think leadership a, a weird thing. I don't think it's a sole guy with this team. I think Polite Osborne certainly fit into that. But I think Harry and Justin are just as much part of that because they're going to push it in practice. They know what it's like. They know what the product needs to be for them to be good. 
And they're guys that everybody around that building trusts and the coaching staff especially trusts. They love that those guys came back. And Wyatt Wilkes fits into that some to some degree as well, maybe to a lesser degree than the other four guys, but it's a group thing. I, I, I'm, I have no concerns about leadership with this group. One, because I think this group likes each other a heck of a lot. But two, I also think there's enough guys that have been through the fire and been through the wars that wholeheartedly understand what it takes when it goes and gets tough. Hey, I'm glad you mentioned Justin and Harry because Harry's going on what will be his third year as a captain. And I think that's huge that you know these guys are extensions of the coaching staff. And when I talked to Malik and Polite at ACC tip-off, I asked them about Justin getting that scholarship this summer. And they're like, we were, we were so happy for him just because he's, you know, he's like, his, he's like a coach, but he's a brother at the same time. And that, that's huge for these guys. Have a guy that they can trust on in the apartments, have a guy that they can ask pretty much anything. Cause he's, he's been here for six years now. Um, they, they just know what to expect. And to your point about Malik, I think he's really vocal. I think, I think more outside the locker room, you know, behind the scenes, I, I think he's more of a vocal guy. Cause I saw that when he, when he was redshirting, he, he's a very vocal guy. And saying what needs to be said, when he needs to be said. And I think that's big. Polite's got that, he's got that trend in him where he's, he's not as loud, but he'll speak up when he needs to. And when he does, people are going to listen. And I think that's important. Yeah. And, and just your guys' thoughts on the, the other newcomers that, uh, you know, people who stand all obviously, you know, Matthew Cleveland's a big one. Cameron Fletcher, really intriguing prospect, the uh, uh, transfer from Kentucky. Uh, just what, what can we expect from some of these other newcomers this year? Go ahead, Austin. <laughs> Fletcher's a guy that, you know, his freshman season at Kentucky was strange. You've never seen anything like it where he, he gets sent home in December for, I'll, I'll say acting out on the bench. I think it's the best way to put it. Gets sent home for two to three weeks. Coach Cal says something on Twitter, and you never see this from a program like Kentucky's Magnitude saying, hey, we're sending a high four-star home for a few weeks. Comes back in. He's dialed in, locked in. Apparently he's a great influence in and out, in and out of the locker room. Decides to transfer, and I've heard nothing but good things since he's been at Florida State. His offensive game is still coming. Um, he's one of those guys. It's going to take a little bit for him to get it all together offensively, but defensively, he's a dog. You know, I think they plan to play him a lot at the four, which I think is perfect for his skill set. Minimizes offense, maximizes defense. Um, he he wants to lock you down ninety four feet, really get in your face, really bother you up and down the court. I think that's big because what I thought we were missing last season was that dog mentality. So, so to get a guy like Fletcher in, I think that's big. You get you get a freshman point guard in Jalen Worley, who has all the potential in the world, plays the game at his own pace, can make shots when needed, long and athletic. It's what you expect from a Florida State point guard. Matthew Cleveland, we, we mentioned him a little bit earlier, filled the bucket up, three-level score, long and rangy. He's really got to improve his free throw shooting. That, that's what I keep hearing from him. He's really got to keep improving his free throw. But he's one of those guys come February where he's – blossoming into the tournament like like we've seen with the freshmen in the past with, with Scotty and Pat and so on and so forth. And then the guy that I think is not being talked about enough is John Butler. You know, seven foot one, can push the pace, grab a rebound, go in transition, but he can shoot, he can finish at the rim. He's exactly – he's kind of like a unicorn. Compare, compares to Porzingis pretty well. Um, he's going to be one that goes – I don't know if it's this year, but you, you look two to three years down the line, and he's one of the best players in the conference. It, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I'll hop in there with Butler. It was I got to watch a little bit of a practice about a week ago. His ability to cover from the three point line to the baseline in movement, it's unbelievable how quickly he can do it. He just he consumes a ton of space. Obviously, he's learning some of the fundamentals of their system, where to be, how to transition off of stuff. That's all little intricacies he's got to learn. But the sense of just gobbling up space, being long, being active, he's unbelievable at it. And he can shoot. Um, which is a really nice bonus for a guy who's a mismatch for a lot of teams because of his size, his athleticism, and the fact that FSU can roll out a couple of seven-footers. Another newcomer who's kind of a newcomer because he was here previously, Naheem, I think it's a really important piece. Got to be a good finisher around the room. Got to be a good blocker around the room. Got to be a guy that changes shots around the room. FSU's big man situation beyond Osborne, of course, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't expect much of Quincy Ballard, but Naheem's a pretty important one for them there. Obviously, uh, they really need him to step up. John Butler, I don't view as much as a true big because he's a bit more of a face up forward. You know, I don't expect him to get down there and grind real hard and be that guy. So it's going to be Engum and uh, Naheem in those situations. They feel good about Tenor taking the next step. He's had a real offseason. He really didn't have that last year. 
He's much better in the strength and conditioning department. I think he's dealt with a little bit of a, a like foot type injury here, but I, I think he's fine. Um, I think it's normal big man situation where the bone's a little brittle type of thing. Uh, so I'm interested to see how much Naheem kind of gets pushed early on. I think Naheem's – Stan Jones likes to yell at his big men sometimes. We saw it a lot with Balsa, but when it starts <laughs> breaking through, it was really, really good. I'm interested with Naheem how much we see that, how much the aggressive push with him to be more is. The only other thing I'd add is Worley, really smart, sharp kid. Uh, I think the brain power with handling the ball is very good. I think his development will be pretty quick. I like him a heck of a lot. Uh, he's a competitor. Uh, his main difference, I think he walked it up court quite a bit in the high school ranks, just a system he played in. Obviously, this is going to be a little bit more tempoed. And then uh, Matt Cleveland, he's a killer when the mid-range is falling. When, when it's consistent, he's going to be just a dude that can fill it up. When the mid-range is off, he can still do plenty, but the mid-range is kind of the key to him being – a guy that can be an all ACC freshman type player. You, you kind of mentioned it with John Butler's offense on knowing where to be. That's that's kind of what I keep hearing about all the freshmen in general is they're, they're still learning where to be. You know, that's the benefit of having like the, the Raekwon Evans and the Justin Linder that they could tell these young guys when you're supposed to cut on this play versus this other play. Cause the, the systems are all very similar. It's just these minor tweaks that know when they're supposed to cut to the opposite corner versus the strong corner. It's things like that they'll have to pick up on, you know, where to be on the court when they catch a pass, how to catch a pass and face the basket, those kind of things they still got to learn. And, and for the first couple of months, the offense may be kind of slow because of it. But it's one of those teams by, you know, late January, early February, they they should be kicking right into gear. And, yeah. and hopefully these freshmen will be playing right along with it. Yeah, I've long, I've long thought that this team is going to have like three segments their season. There's going to be something ugly in that first month. We're going to see it kind of figure itself out in that second month, and hopefully it hits its stride heading into that third month. Um, the practice I went to, Polite got banged up, and Gum wasn't doing much. Uh, Mills was kind of sidelined, nothing major. Not, none of the injuries were serious or concerning. Uh, White Wilkes only did about half of it. So you saw several veterans go out. So it was kind of – I commented to somebody afterwards that I got to watch the sausage being made, and it wasn't really appealing to see how it was made. It wasn't a particularly good practice. But it's because so many young guys were in there trying to figure it out. And you could tell that when they don't have that crutch to fall back on of the veteran telling them or the guy just managing it on the court in real time, it, it was interesting to see. But you still see a boatload of talent with a lot of young kids running around out there. And the best thing I can say about the young guys, and it's been a consistent messaging since the minute they stepped on campus, was one, we got to put weight on them, and that's happening. But two, they ask questions. They want to learn. They're aggressive in trying to learn. And they're very receptive to learning. And they're receptive to coaches, receptive to teammates, and they're guys that like putting in extra time in the gym. The the team dynamic is once again outstanding for FSU. That that's pretty clear before the season's even tipped off. That this group top to bottom, what's made some of the recent groups special in the sense of work ethic, good leadership, uh, you know, one to fifteens as important, you know, the best players as important as the walk on, the Viper, the green guys. Um that's true again for this bunch. And that has me excited for what we're going to see. Now, I think Purdue's going to be interesting. I think that's a that that's a challenge very early in the year. I think that's going to tell us a little bit about what this team can handle before they start hitting their stride. But, uh, yeah, I'll quit rambling. <laughs> no, I was, I was going to say, them getting in the gym, especially those young guys, that, that's what I keep hearing, is they're just always in the gym, always getting shots up. I, I'm still friends with a lot of managers and GAs there, and they're like – and. and Every night they're posting stuff on their stories with all the young guys getting shots up. These guys are just always in the gym and they're sponges. They're just learning everything they can, and it's huge. Because you know, I'm not gonna name any names, but there's there's guys in the past that just think, oh yeah, I'm that guy. I'm gonna do what I want to do. It's not how Florida State rolls. It's not it's not how they operate. We know that. Get these young guys in that, the, that want to learn, want to get better, want to get to a level Florida State hasn't been at. That's huge. Yeah, and it's. Obviously, the the culture Ham has built around this program it's just phenomenal. It's it's not easy to do it, and it's even tougher to sustain. But he's done so. And Chris, you kind of hinted on you know the schedule with Purdue. Uh, you know, <laughs> shocker, shocker, Florida State's going to Indiana for the ACC Big Ten Challenge again. Um, but I want to talk about the home schedule real quick because there, there's a major milestone that Florida State's shooting for, and the, the people in the the triangle will not be happy if they make this happen. 
Florida State is two games shy of breaking Duke's record for most home game ACC wins in a row. They play Syracuse on the 4th of December in Louisville on January 8th, an 8 p.m. Saturday night game at the Tucker Center. Talk about an environment I would love to be at, assuming they do beat Syracuse. Um, but just, uh, you know, thoughts on this home record, because when I was in Florida State 2006 to 2010, you know, it was me and like six friends in the null zone jumping up and down like idiots with, with nobody around us. And now to see it on TV and to see what that, that arena has become uh, during these games, it's been phenomenal. And Austin, you got to see it, you know, as a manager during your time there. Uh, what would this win streak mean for Florida State to take it from the king of the ACC, Duke, in a conference where we're, we've always kind of been the redheaded stepchild? Um, and how likely is that to happen? I, I feel well, I feel very confident they're going to tie it with the Syracuse game. The Louisville game is obviously a little bit more of a challenge. We'll see what Louisville is as we're rolling into January. Also, where FSU is in their evolution at that point. So that's a heck of a challenge. But I feel good every time FSU takes the court in the Tucker Center. Last year when they lost to UCF, and last year was weird with attendance, COVID, everything involved in it. But when they lost to UCF at home, it was a odd feeling because they just never do that anymore. And we've grown so accustomed to them being so good in the tuck. And I don't think that's going away. I, I think this program does a great job of kind of handing things down year over year with the leadership and the guys guiding it and the, the mentality and the way the approach is and all that. And I think that is something that's become infused in all of that that's handed down. I don't think Anthony Polite's going to let his guys forget that they protect their home court. So I'm looking forward to it. That Louisville game should be a heck of a game. Um, but yeah, I, if I had to bet some money on it, I'd bet that FSU breaks that record and boy, it's really going to break my heart to see it not belong to tobacco <laughs> road anymore. Yeah, and if Florida state breaks that record, you have such a great stretch afterwards to stretch that lead because their next game after that is, I believe Miami. Mm -hmm. And then you get Duke at it home is. after that. So, and that after you beat Duke, it's, you know, it's Wake Forest, it's Virginia tech. It's, it's teams that I think Florida state can beat. So, they get this record. They have, they have a real chance to go on a huge run here, especially at home. But to your point about, you know, me seeing this firsthand, how, how Florida State's just been able to dominate a home. You, you go my first year there, which was the 16-17 season with John Isaac. Nobody's in the crowd. I mean, just 50% attendance for what I still think is the most talented team I've ever seen at Florida State. Maybe not the best, but the most talented, absolutely. I remember the Big Ten game against what was a really good Minnesota team, a top 25 team. Just nobody in the crowd. But Florida State's still going out there, still defending home court. And the fact that I can count on one hand how many losses we've seen at home in the last five years, that's incredible. You know, these guys just, they, they want to put it on for their fans. They want to protect home court. And even the times they lose at home, outside of UCF, which was a 1-100 in 100 game, because UCF was making everything. No matter what Florida State was throwing at them defensively, UCF was just making shots. Sometimes that's all it comes down to. But you go to that Louisville game in 2018, Florida State was up 10 at half, lost by single digits. Same thing with Virginia that season, which and it went, was the number one team at the time, up 10 at half, fell apart in the second half. Cam Reddish shot in 2019. It, it's one of those arenas that just weird things happen. I, I always say it's the lighting, because lighting in there is terrible, especially when you're looking up trying to get a rebound or trying to shoot it. The lighting's just awful. And, and teams just aren't used to it. And, and it's a really deep arena, too. I don't think a lot of people realize that depth perception matters so much in basketball. And, and for some of these teams that are, you know, have smaller arenas, there's not a lot of seats behind the arena, behind the basket. So you go to Florida state and that's where most of the seating is. It, it's unique, but Florida state just, they do such a great job of protecting home court, making shots when it matters. It, it's a special environment. And, and I really wish I could be there for the Louisville game. If they do in fact beat Syracuse, which I think they will, but, that's going to be a special game against Louisville because Chris Mack has never beaten Florida State at Louisville. His only win against Florida State came while he was at Xavier in the 2017 tournament when they just smacked the crap out of us all game. Yeah, that was uh, I was in Vegas for a bachelor party for that game. That was that was rough, but they they definitely made it up the next year by uh, returning the favor to, to Chris Mack in the tournament. Uh, but but looking ahead, just at the, the schedule itself and. It, it, we're not going to go game by game here or anything. Obviously, Purdue's a big one. You know, Florida early on will be fun to make that eight in a row there. But j just looking at the schedule, the ACC, it looks to be down from what it typically normally would be. Um, 
what is the ceiling for this team? Because I feel like we're spoiled now as Florida State fans. Obviously, the tournament is a total crapshoot, right? So, it, you know, we, we think six, Sweet 16 or bust at this point. But upsets happen in, in the round of 32 especially. Um, but assuming we can avoid that, is this a team that can make a run at a Final Four? Or is their ceiling a little before that? You can go first if you want to ask yeah, while the bigs are probably the weakest we've seen since like 2015, 2016 era, college basketball is so dominated by guards nowadays that it's not unlikely that Florida State goes in the tournament hot and, you know, Jalen Worley is playing good at the right time. Caleb Mills is clicking like we expect him to all season. Matthew Cleveland's rounding the form. Raekwon Evans is playing well. I expect him to have a much better season than last year when he was so inconsistent. I think I just think Florida State's so guard heavy, and we saw Baylor do it last year, where their where their best line is where their three guards playing at the same time. I think Florida State's trying to emulate that to some extent this year, where they could just go out and you know be faster, still be long and athletic because their their shortest guy that they're going to play is Raquan Evans at six four. They just have the length, they have the scoring, they have the they have the ball handling, which I didn't think they had last year when you're trying to break Scotty Barnes in a new position. It, it wouldn't surprise me make them for them to make a run. I do think Sweet 16 is about what do I expect. I'm not going to predict them to go further. And I think people are really sleeping on the early part of the schedule. You know, you you, you look at it and you're like, eh, Loyola Marymount, who's that? SMU, whatever. Loyola Marymount's good, like really good. They're third in the West Coast Conference last year, which is the same conference Gonzaga plays in. And this was their first year under a new head coach. So now you come back with the second year, they get everybody back. That's going to be a good team when you have to play them in the Jacksonville Classic. And then, depending on the result of that game, you're playing either SMU or Missouri, who aren't great, but they're, they're still solid teams. Um, Boston University was picked to win their conference. Like, like There's some good teams in, in this non-conference slate that it's going to get Florida State warmed up for conference play and into the tournament. We mentioned Purdue earlier. Purdue's amazing. They get their top eight producers back from last season from what was a really young team. That Purdue's going to be dangerous. I mean, like Final Four kind of dangerous. and. To have yeah, to go play them in Purdue, that's going to be a really hard game. I think Purdue's the best team FSU plays this year, at least on paper, preseason, all that fun stuff. I, Yeah, I, I think Purdue would be the best team in the ACC. That's yeah. just kind of my opinion. The one thing I'll add about the Jacksonville games is that those are going to be sleepy arena games probably. I don't expect particularly great crowds around Thanksgiving for those. Hopefully Jacksonville Seminoles turn out. You know, make me look stupid for making that comment. And it's raucous and it's in support of FSU. Um, in Florida, I don't know what Mike White's club's going to be. I don't trust Mike White basketball club at UF for whatever reason. It just hasn't got going for him there like it was at Law Tech and such. But I am interested in that game because, for the love of God, Florida knows that they have to beat FSU at some <laughs> point. Like, Mike White can only lose to FSU so many consecutive times before he loses his job. So I am interested in that. The, the conference schedule – I. I think college basketball is going to be – college football has been fairly weird. I think college basketball is going to be fairly weird this year. There's been so much transfer and change. There's going to be so many young guys playing for clubs that are traditionally very strong basketball teams. Uh, I, I'm just very interested to watch it kind of play out in real time. I, you know, I, I want to do an exercise of going back to last year, and last year was weird and unique because of COVID. But looking at preseason predictions for, like, all conference teams, uh, how conferences would play out, stuff like that, and see how much of it hit and how much of it just completely whiffed. Because I feel like there's an equal amount on each side. I think that's going to be a continuing trend with basketball. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's, it's been I fascinating agree. with the football season, the, the way that, that these spreads have turned out and uh, ex point expectancy for you know win differential has, has just been wild. It, it'll be interesting to see if, if it is much like that when basketball rolls around here in just a few short weeks. Um and uh, you kind of mentioned it, it, Mike White. He he needs to hurry up and beat Florida State because uh, we're not sure how many years Coach Hamilton has left. Obviously, uh, looking at him today, he could go another ten years if he wanted. It seems like, but uh, that's kind of what I want to get you uh, guys out here on is uh, how many years does Coach Ham have left? Um, and then uh, we'll touch on recruiting briefly right after that. Yeah, well, he if, was if doing... Cam, he's got 30 years left. Yeah. He, he made yeah, the showcase to see tip off where you know, he's, he's still dealing with his Achilles injury. Um, he's getting off the stage. It's, someone front row goes, uh, it's not it's not fun getting old. And he goes, I'm still 25. What are you talking about? <laughs> so if you ask him, he's still got 30, 40 years left. Yeah. I, I think realistically, um, 
I think his contract goes through, was it 25? 25 yeah. or 26. Um, I think realistically, he, he finishes, finishes out that contract, and you call up Coach Dennis Gates at Cleveland State and say, hey, you want to come back to Tallahassee? We'll, we'll see what happens. Ham's going to go as long as he wants to go, and uh, they're not going to force him out. There's there's no shot. He's he's earned that right now. Yeah. He, he's he's earned that right, and he's he's doing as well as he ever has at any school. Yeah. So he's going to go on his own terms, but I, I think he's going to, at the very least, finish out this contract. He was doing a Zoom here in the last couple of weeks, and he like emphatically just came out and said, "You know, I'm not interested in going anywhere. Like, I like coaching basketball. He he enjoys it. Like, I don't. We he deals in enough sports to know that for some of them it's a job and it wears on them. I don't feel that way with Coach Ham. Coach Ham really really likes coaching basketball. He loves his staff dynamic with Stan, with Steve, with Cy, and the support staff and guys like Laz who help and all of them." He really likes what he has going on there. He likes the dynamic of his team. You know, I think beyond like name image likeness and OTE, the overtime elite and that stuff, like navigating those new waters. I don't think there's anything about the job that he doesn't like except for that stuff. And that stuff's more just, he's trying to figure out what the next step is with it being relatively new, how FSU addresses it goes about doing it. And, you know, I, I think that's the only thing recently that he would complain about with regards to the job. He's in fairly good health for a man of his age. He looks better physically than he did when FSU hired him. I mean, he's like he's aging backwards. He's Benjamin Button. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think he wants to walk away from the game now. Eventually, his wife might convince him to do so. <laughs> but I, he, I've never gotten the feeling that Ham's staring at the light at the end of the tunnel. I've always felt like he's very much in tune when I'm worried about this year, this club, recruiting for the next club keep going, but I think he feels very comfortable that he's created a coaching tree where he can easily hand the baton off, and he's going to leave this program in such a better place than he found it, which was ultimately his goal the day he was hired here. It was, one, to try to win championships, but two, certainly to improve FSC basketball, and he's done an incredibly great job of that. I mean, we're we're enjoying the golden age of FSU basketball, and I appreciate that every day as someone who sat through Steve Robinson seasons and some of the incredibly – disgusting forms of basketball we had after those early years of Pat Kennedy in the league. Yeah. It was, I mean, Chris, I remember it was what my junior year, me, uh, my buddy, Sean Breslin and some other people were popping champagne on the top of the parking garage after we beat Clemson towards the end of the year. Cause we're like, we're finally going to the NCAA tournament, which is yeah. something that, you know, we, we celebrated like we won a national title. And I think Florida state fans, especially ones that have jumped on board recently, don't really, uh, you know, have the appreciation they should for where this program is right now, because it's it's rose into heights I never would have thought, you know, from even when I graduated from Florida State in 2010. Well, um, those early years of Ham, they couldn't win. A, FSU had not won a road game in several years in the league when Ham came in, and it was a battle. I think they broke through. I want to say it was against Maryland, and I just remember that feeling of like it happened. I remember Coach Ham back then saying, "Once you win one, you're going to win several," because it's just. It's a hurdle. You got to get over the hurdle. And he's jumped this program over so many hurdles that now winning is the custom. And I, I just, I enjoy it. I, I like, enjoy, I like watching FSU basketball. I enjoy it. I appreciate the staff a great deal. I think they're good men who do a hell of a job with the young men that they're raising, but it's just, the product's phenomenal. Like it blows my mind how people don't appreciate it more. It disappoints me that that place isn't constantly packed out in rockets. Now it's gotten better. You know, Austin was talking about the J.I. season and how disappointing some of those early crowds were that year. It's come a long way from that, but there's still ways for it to go. FSU is allowed to be a basketball school if they want to. They can be more than one sport school, and they've certainly earned the right to be a basketball school with the results on the court. But at the same time, I think they're kind of – I don't want to say they're okay with it, but they've accepted that maybe we're not the moneymaker of the of the university, but we're still going to go show out, and if people want to support us, Cool, but we're not going to look for your respect. We're not going to ask for it. We're going to show you, hey, we're a damn good basketball team. And they've done that for five years now. Even when they didn't have a great season in 17, 18, they still made the Elite Eight because they just had that competitiveness and that fire that just they had to get there. I think crowds have come a long way. Like Chris said, that Louisville game um, when Trent um, killed Jordan Nora, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Just the environment, and, and you hear Jay Billis say, that's the best crowd I've ever heard. 
you, you hear that kind of stuff. You're like, he's talking about Florida State. This this can't be this can't be Florida State. There's got to be some other school he's talking about. They've come a long way, but I'd still like to see, you know, when Florida State plays Tulane, I still like to see that 90% full. It won't be. I, I know it won't be, but I'd like to see it happen. They, they've at the very least they've earned it, in my opinion. Yeah, they, they absolutely have. And I was going to touch on some recruiting, but we're running short here. This is my second podcast of the night, fellas. The wife is not happy, and she says we have to get started on The Bachelorette. So I, I guess I'm getting ready to do that. But before we go, I, I just want to thank Austin Vizia again, Noel Game Day, Sports Illustrated Affiliate, and the Hear the Sphere podcast, and Chris Nee of Knowles 24-7 and On the Bench. Uh, guys, just let, let them know where everybody can find you and all your work. Go ahead, Austin. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at Knowles Vikes V's. Um, also follow us at the Noel Game Day and at Hear the Spear on Twitter. Um, and on Instagram, uh, my handle is at easy underscore VZ. Twitter for us is Knowles247. Personal Twitter is CNE247. I keep it just based on work. It's mostly links to the site, truthfully. All the works on Knowles247.com. My Instagram's insanely boring, so I'm not going to bore people with that. Yeah, and, and for the listeners out here, you know, uh, I, I'm a big fan, and uh, you know, I, I do a basketball minute that I talk about once a week, and, and that's about it. But I get most of my information from these two right here, so definitely go go give those guys follows, check them out, and again, really appreciate you. Uh, appreciate Harlan in the background producing this, and we will see you on Thursday night for our Clemson preview.